morning. Good morning. As you probably noticed on the top of your bulletin this morning, we're in the fourth Sunday of Lent. And we've been working through this Restore Us theme. Today, our theme is Restore Us, We See. And I was happy that they put that in the positive this week. The last week it was Restore Us, O God, We Thirst. And so we started in the negative, trying to move toward it. We could have done that. You could have said, Restore us, O God, we are blind. But I think it's always useful to start in the positive, to say, there are, there are things we see already. It makes it dangerous because at the end, Jesus says, if you claim to see, then you're responsible to. We'll get there. <laughs> Seeing is, in some sense, automatic for most of us. We were born seeing. All of us were born seeing, and as we get older, sort of less and less clear in the world around us. But for the most part, it was an automatic thing. But seeing well is not automatic. So when I go into an art gallery, and I stand in front of a painting, I go, yeah, looks like a painting to me, and I move on to the next painting, because I don't know nothing about painting. But seeing a painting well, if you, if you stand there with somebody who's been taught how to see a painting, and they can talk about the play of shadow and light and darkness and the contrast between the various figures and the way color was used and, and, and brush strokes and all sorts of things that I don't see because I just see, oh yeah, that's a painting, and then I move on to the next one. So, so painting is not so seeing is also a learned skill, seeing well. And, and seeing itself is also seeing in the sense of understanding is even more a sense of a learned skill that women are taught to see the world from a male perspective. Right? And, and, and so that because, because in our common language, the male perspective, the male way to see the world is normal. And then there's sort of normal and then there's a women's perspective. Um, or poor people are taught to see the world from the perspective of the wealthy. So there's normal and then there's poor people. Right? And so, so in that sense, the way we see the world is also something that, that we are taught. So this morning I asked you to read, to see this passage from a number of different perspectives. And at least you had a chance to look at the same story and to be two different characters. And that's what, I, um, that's what I want to talk about this morning, is the way these different characters interacted with the story in terms of what they saw and what they didn't see and what they... Right? So that's what we're going to do. So the disciples. The disciples only get one statement. So if you got the disciples part, you didn't really have much to say. But the disciples ask the question, the initial question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Which, in that culture, was the obvious question. It was the important question. Because the assumption was that handicaps, things like that, came from sin. They were a punishment from God for some some past, or I guess in the man's case, some future is in, because he was born blind. And, and we think, that's a strange question. Like, who would ask a question like that? What a horrible question to ask. Right? To meet someone who's blind, to walk up to him and go, so, you know, who sinned, you or your parents, that you're blind? What an awful thing to say. But, but what happens if we don't ask the question? What do we think then? Do we think that, well, people are just born handicapped because God arbitrarily does this? Does God just go, oh yeah, you? I think about this in the context of my own daughter. Um, my daughter was born healthy and, and vigorous and strong. And then as a, as a teenager, she developed severe scoliosis in her back. So her back bone instead of going like this, went like this in a big S curve. And so she had an operation and they opened up her back and they filled it full of titanium and screws and fusion and all of this sort of stuff. And it didn't go very well, is the way she put it. Um, and she lives her life in chronic pain. 
So who sinned? Or does God just go, oh yeah, you. And I talked to her about this last night. I said, Aaron, how, how do you think about your chronic pain in God? And she says, I've tried a number of answers and none of them have worked very well. So she just doesn't think about it anymore. It's one of those mysteries that she's just sort of set aside for now. But it's just a reminder to us that just because we don't like the disciples' question doesn't mean that it isn't still a question. What, what, what do we think about the role of God? What do we see when we see this? So the disciples start out this whole story by asking this question about sin. And from then on they don't get to say anything. But they do get to see. They get to see at least a chunk of the story that they are with Jesus, that Jesus sees. And so their role is crucial because they are witnesses. They are the ones who see. And because they are the ones who see, they are the ones who tell the story. And ultimately this story, in there, this story is one that is told because somebody witnessed it, because somebody saw. Right? And so right, the disciples are quiet throughout most of this story, but they in some ways have the most crucial role. They have the role of witnesses. They are the ones who see and then later spoke and wrote. And now we get to read and see in our own ways. So that is not a, it didn't, I realize it didn't feel like a big part when you were reading it. But in the end, it becomes the most crucial role of all. The neighbors. The neighbors want to know the facts. Who is he? Who did this? How did this happen? Right? The sort of, we just want to know all of the facts. And so their perspective, what they see and what they didn't see, and what they understood and what they didn't understand, reminds us that you can have all of the facts about the case and still not understand the truth. They gathered the facts. They understood the basic, this is what happened and this is who did it. But they didn't understand the truth. They never got to there. And ultimately, it's not a matter of, right, it's not just a matter of the facts. But there is something beyond that this is pointing to. It. And especially in the Gospel of John, there's always the, the basic facts. But that doesn't get you to the real truth. So that is the, right, that is where the neighbors only get to. Because, right, you can see this because the neighbors get all of the facts, and then they take the blind man and they go to, well, you think that maybe they would take the blind man and go to Jesus. Because he opened the blind man's eyes, and maybe you'd want to go and see this healer. And maybe that's what you want to see. You want to go say, you want to go say, wow, who did this to you? Let's go see. But instead, they took the blind man to the Pharisees. So they saw the blind man and they collected all of the facts and they got and they ended up not going the right place. So there is there is right just this clear illustration of yes, you can see, and yes, you can gather all of the facts. But this does not necessarily lead you to truth. It does not lead you in the right direction. I realize those of you hardcore science people here may have difficulty with this idea that you can gather all the facts and still not know the truth. Um, so, you, this Gospel of John is just not your Gospel, okay? That's okay. The Pharisees. The Pharisees have a dilemma. The Pharisees have a dilemma because, right, there they've got a problem. On the one hand, right, it's pretty clear this man was healed, give glory to God. On the other hand, this happened on the Sabbath, a law was broken, there's a problem. It's like if you're driving 
wandering through the hills of West Virginia and you have no idea where you're going and finally you come across a sign that says Morgantown and then the arrows are pointing in both directions. You're going, well, that is not a helpful sign. And well, that's what the Pharisees are seeing when they see Jesus. They see a sign and one of them says, yes, God, and the other goes, no, definitely going in the wrong direction. So they are, they are confused, right? So again, right, it's not, the, the sign sometimes aren't as clear as you want them to be. Corey and I discovered that yesterday, wandering our way through the hills of West Virginia and Maryland, that you come across this sign and it's not helpful. So anyway, this happens, right? So, the, so signs, right, signs aren't just... Signs are only signs when you understand them. Ultimately, a stop sign is just a red piece of tin on a stick. It only becomes a stop sign when you understand what it's for. If you had never seen one before and didn't know the rules, you'd go, oh look, there's a red piece of tin on a stick. It only becomes a sign when you understand it. But in the end, in the end the Pharisees unite. And they unite because their power is threatened. They are, in their own minds, the ones who see. They are the ones who understand. And the blind man is the one who's threatening their sight. He's saying, don't you see? Or do you see? And they're going, no, no, you don't have the authority to see or not see here. We are the ones who see. And so the, what unites them is their common, uh, the, the, the way they hold on to their own authority. That is ultimately the most important thing for them. And of course, for them, the story ends in a very, very difficult teaching. When, you, if you claim to see, then you have a problem. Because to see is to be responsible. If you claim to see and you don't do anything, you are responsible for your actions in that case. If you say, I don't understand, that's okay then. You are not responsible when you don't understand. So that's the Pharisees. Jesus. Sometimes John is a frustrating gospel. And you could go, Jesus, can you just give us a straight answer to a question once? <laughs> Alright, last week we did, what did we do last week? Thirst, right? The water wasn't water, it was water. And bread wasn't just bread, it was bread. Today, seeing isn't just seeing, it's seeing. You have to sort of learn to speak in capital letters. In order, to, in order to read the Gospel of John. And, and, and so, so, you know, the disciples ask this question, and Jesus wanders away through some answer about, you know, and the Pharisees ask a question, and Jesus goes, I am the light of, oh, you know. So sometimes Jesus is, is frustrated in John. It's like people ask simple questions, and he doesn't, he doesn't give simple answers. But, but sometimes the answers aren't simple. Sometimes they're just not straightforward. And Jesus always stands there in John as a sign. He doesn't just do signs. He does, he is the sign. And people have to see. People have to drink. People have to eat. People have to make up their own mind. And then respond. So Jesus stands there and says, here I am, respond, follow, eat, drink, see, and then do, and then act accordingly. Finally, the blind man. Initially, the blind man doesn't see Jesus. He comes up to Jesus. And Jesus says, well, go wash in the pool of Siloam. When he goes and washes in the pool of Siloam, comes back, Jesus is gone. He hasn't seen Jesus. So when the disciple, when the neighbors ask him, who was it? He goes, I don't know. It was just 
some guy told me to do stuff. I didn't see him. I've never, right, he's never seen anything in his life. So he comes back seeing and he doesn't see. So in the blind man's case, we, we watch this movement. We don't watch just the movement from blindness to sight. We watch the movement in his understanding of Jesus. Right? At first, Jesus is just some guy who talks to him in the crowd. And then, after he gets healed, Jesus becomes the healer, the dude who healed him. And then, when the Pharisees ask him, who is this man, or what do you think of him? He says, ah, he is a prophet. And then, when he meets Jesus, he says, right, Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy says, well, who is the Son of Man? I haven't seen any Son of Man. And Jesus says, that's me. And then he believes, and then he worships. So we see this movement from, not just from blindness to sight, but a, but a much larger movement, um, not even, even past understanding, to worship. We don't ultimately know what happens to the blind man. The story just leaves him at this point. We have to sort of assume that he goes on with his life. Obviously, he doesn't go on with his life the way it was, because he can see now. Which means that well, he, can't, no, he can't any longer just beg there as a blind man. He can't put out a little sign saying, Formerly blind man wants your money. <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Right? But he can see. So that's our challenge. And our challenge is, as people who claim to see, what do we do next? What is our challenge for the week? What is God putting in front of us this week to see? What are we going to see? And then, of course, what are we going to do?